Take a mic. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Matt. Uh, I work for Anaconda. Uh, before I start, I want to first encourage, if you haven't seen it, to watch Tom's talk from earlier this morning. Who saw that talk? I'm curious. Okay, That is like definitely the main DAS talk of the session. This is like the wacky talk. So go on YouTube afterwards. Maybe go outside while I'm talking and, and watch Tom's talk instead. So about skill of machine learning, pandas, that's like sort of the core DAS functionality most people start with. This is going to be a little bit wackier. It's going to be a little bit more about some more low-level APIs. I also want to thank, so I, I lost my charger like 20 minutes ago, which was a, a huge source of stress for me. I was asking around, and someone left a perfect Lenovo charger here on the top of the stand for me. So thank you whoever did that. And, you know, grr to everyone who uses Macs. My charger is now less and less common these days. <laughs> so uh, so uh, this will be a combination of slides and uh, live demonstrations. Uh, the demonstrations I'm going to do are demonstrations you can do exactly. Uh, if you go to, so my slides are at matthewrockland.com slash slides slash anaconda2018. I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. So just we can look at that. And the bottom of that page is a link to a, a binder, uh, which will give you a, a single pod on Google Compute Engine, I think, that's running all the same examples on a very tiny, tiny cluster. So I'm going to use that myself. Uh, so we're going to, when you click on that link, you'll be launched into a little notebook. And we're going to be using the futures and streaming data frames uh, examples today. Uh, but there's other ones you might want to look at too if I get bored, boring. So check out the slides, play with the notebooks. Everything I'm going to do, you can do as well. Okay. So today, the actual topic, about real-time processing and uh, Dask also. So I work mostly on Dask, which is a general library for parallel computing. By real-time processing, I mean that I want to, there we go. I want to combine data analysis, like using NumPy or Pandas or Scikit-Learn, uh, along with operational systems. So I've got events happening in real time, I've got data coming off of Kafka streams, I've got people hitting web addresses. I want to do things. I want to act based on reality. This is sometimes scalable, but it sometimes isn't. Uh, it's often just very real-time, very fast situations. So we're going to talk about a few uh, examples. Where this comes up a bit. Uh, so we have things like streaming data frames. This is maybe what most people think of immediately. They think of real-time systems. They think of Spark Streaming. They think of Flink. You have a bunch of data coming off of some Kafka system or some other streaming data source, like a socket or a Unix file. You want to transform and aggregate that data, ideally with some kind of pandas-like API. You want to shape and control the flow of that data between maybe many different sources and many, many different endpoints. That can get a little confusing. You want to play with you know, time control, buffering. There's lots of things that sort of are in the middle of managing up flows between a variety of endpoints. You want to publish the dashboards and trigger events. We're also going to look at a very different kind of problem, just responding to network requests. This often doesn't have any coordination between what you're doing. It's just you want to, something comes to you, you want to farm it off to some other machine, run some computation, send back a response. And then third, this would be sort of amorphous, but advanced distributed algorithms. So a lot of people use DAS today to do what I'm going to classify as wacky stuff, uh, and this sort of a catch-all for that phrase. And we'll get into a little bit of how to do that. Uh, so to show quick examples of those, um, this is not a live demo. I apologize. I usually do this live, and I just can't. I was a little bit busy this, this week. So uh, as an example, we're going to look at uh, NetFlow data. So uh, on my laptop, I apologize for the very slow, uh, very small font. Uh, on my laptop, uh, I can look at all the packets wandering through that laptop. This might be showing you know, me talking to the router, me talking to Google, me talking to Amazon, me talking to myself. And you can, on your laptop, do this with the TCB dump. Uh, Library. This is actually a great source of streaming data. So it's showing the IP address uh, of the source, the destination, the port of the source and destination, some other information about it. This is way too small and way too detailed to actually read and make, make sense of. So instead, we might look at uh, producing some sort of dashboard. So how do we take that streaming data source, that NetFlow data coming off of our, our network card, how do we turn that into something that you know, an analyst might look at that we can gain insight off of? So this is going to use a project called Streams and Bokeh. It'll come up in just a moment here. Uh, and this is uh, a visual view of that same data set running live. As you can see, the, uh, the source, destination ports, source and destination IPs uh, on the top. On the bottom, you can see uh, that view filtered a little bit. 
I'll jump ahead a little bit here. So we might look at, say, uh, port 22 is SSH traffic. And as I SSH to a machine and type ls a bunch, we're seeing a lot of activity on that port. So this is, again, a live system. Things are happening. I'm SSHing into machines. I'm getting traffic out. And we're seeing that live on a dashboard. This is using pandas. This is using bokeh, using a library called streams to tie them together. I'm going to SSH into that same machine again. So there's now two active ports down here on the lower left. So again, real things happening in real time. Brief explanation. I apologize for the small font. Uh, but this, this video is also available in the slides. Totally different and way less sexy demonstration. Uh, I have here a very simple web server. Uh, I'm using Tornado here. This font is more legible. Um, and this, this, uh, this is uh, just a very simple REST endpoint, and you give it a number, and it computes the Fibonacci, uh, Fibonacci value of that number. So I might, for example, look at Fib of 10, and it returns to me back a response. You know, Fib is 55. So this is not something you'd actually do. Uh, please don't calculate the Fibonacci number this way. But uh, you might replace the Fib function with some scikit-learn predict uh, model. You know, please place in here your own operational system. This might be a database query. This might be running some computation, et cetera. And what we find is as we increase this number, we can sort of tailor how slow things are going to be. And what we find is that when we're doing computation inside of our, our web server, uh, that can block the rest of our web server. This is really expensive. Never, ever do this. And so the question is, how do we, so how do we build other systems that interact with our web server that can be low latency, that can interact with uh, you know, concurrent protocols? This is a very different kind of distributed computing. You might use tools like Celery for this or just general web technologies like Nginx. We're going to talk a little bit about how to use Dask for that instead. So that's going to be sort of example number two. So this is a slight variant, uh, which does exactly what we want. Okay. Example number three, uh, you can build wacky distributed algorithms. Uh, most of the work I do with this is actually with finance companies who are really, really quiet about what they do. So I have no concrete example to show you. However, Eric Welch, uh, who also works for Anaconda, has a side project here, Dask Pattern Search, which does gradient-free uh, optimization. And so it's a relatively simple API that looks at uh, an objective function and uh, evaluates that function at various points, and based on those evaluations, uh, focuses its effort uh, on areas that it thinks will be effective. This is based on some paper that I didn't read, but Eric, Eric appreciated. Uh, so uh, the optimal point here is in the center at the origin. And you'll notice that it's, as it's learning, as a sort of evaluating the function in various places, it's focusing more and more effort, or there are more and more points scattered around that central point. So it's learning as it goes, and it's tailoring its computation on the fly. So real-time processing may also be in the scope of a single application, just shaping that computation as we go. Those are three examples to get you in the spirit of what I mean when I say real-time processing. Uh, there are many tools that you can use to solve these problems. Uh, there are also many tools you can use to scale these problems. And I want to make it clear that you don't have to scale and solve them at the same time. So I'm talking about Dask today. Dask is often used for scalable computing, but it doesn't have to be. You don't have to use Dask to talk about other systems as well. So you have many options today. For streaming data frames, people tend to use something like Flink or Spark Streaming, or Beam. You know, of these, I'd say Spark Streaming probably has the best Python API. For things like network requests, you might use just the normal web stack. You might load balance in various ways. Uh, but if you're in Python, uh, you might use something like Concurrent Futures or Celery. Uh, Celery is a very common task queuing system that's used in this case. Just out of curiosity, who here has used Celery? Right, some. Yeah, it's actually rare to see in the sort of data science side of Python. It's much more common in the web programming side. Uh, but it's a nice tool for this sort of thing. For advanced distributed algorithms, there are a few choices. Uh, ZeroMQ is commonly used. There's a very cool new project called Ray I'd like to point people to. And a lot of, people, a lot of times people just use sockets and queues and a lot of uh, personal pain. Uh, so you, you build your own stuff usually. Uh, and if you've ever worked in finance, you're aware of uh, people building custom magical things uh, that are never ever usable outside of that particular <coughs> situation. So uh, you have many options, but I'm going to talk about my favorite, uh, Dask. Uh, so Dask can use all, all the situations. Uh, it is not necessarily always the best solution, uh, but it is useful in a variety of ways. We'll talk about uh, those ways, and hopefully that'll inspire you to use it in other applications that may be similar, but different from what I've shown here. So uh, 
again, you should watch Tom's talk from today, uh, earlier today, or go onto YouTube and there are dozens of talks by myself or others on Dask generally. Uh, at a very high level, Dask is commonly used to paralyze things like NumPy and Pandas and Scikit-Learn. Uh, however, uh, that is only sort of a few front ends to Dask. Generally speaking, Dask is, is a dynamic task scheduling system that can be uh, much more flexible and used in many more applications than just those. Uh, so it uh, scales nicely from laptops to supercomputers. It is resilient, it is real time, it is responsive. It has sort of millisecond-ish, you know, 10 to 20 millisecond latencies for round trips, around 300 microsecond overheads. Uh, depending on your application, that is either very fast or extremely slow. Uh, so you can, you know, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna leave how high performance Dask is to you based on those numbers. But that gives you a sense of, of how, it's, how it's being used. So at a high level, Dask, again, this is sort of the overview, Dask takes uh, high level APIs like NumPy arrays or Pandas data frames or scikit-learn operations and it translates those into task graphs. So the image on the bottom is a task graph. Every circle here corresponds to uh, one uh, fit operation on one scikit-learn model on a NumPy array with some parameters. And this is a modestly complex grid search and pipeline uh, over those things. So one problem is how to turn your high-level objective into many small Python functions that are connected by edges, which is data dependencies. The other challenge is to execute uh, that task graph. And this is a problem of, of networking, this is a problem of resilience, this is a problem of load balancing. There's nothing to do with parallel algorithms. Uh, this is much more about execution. We're not gonna touch the first part. We're not gonna talk about algorithms today. We're mostly just gonna talk about how to build uh, custom complex systems with these graphs, with lower level APIs, and how to do that in a real time way. So if we wanted to take this real time, we can, so how do we use this in a real time situation? And we can do that if this graph is allowed to change during the computation. So as we're computing, we add more nodes to this graph. And that is more or less what Dask has to be able to do in order to fit all of these applications we just learned about. So for that, we're gonna talk about Dask futures. I'm gonna give a little bit of a, a little bit of an API lesson here, and then we're gonna see it in action, which I think will be more exciting. So if you don't see, understand something at first glance, you'll have another shot in a moment. Or again, if I'm boring you, you can always go online and run through the examples right now. So Dask futures uh, inherit the concurrent futures model from Python. Concurrent futures users, I'm curious. Okay. How about the multiprocessing module? Right. The Python core community would prefer that you start using concurrent futures rather than multiprocessing. It is a way better API. It does all the same things, it's nicer. Um, we'll see a little bit of it today. Uh, so Dask futures are low level. Uh, means they don't include pre canned algorithms. There's no join on futures. But they also don't get in your way. You can build your own algorithms very easily. You're not stuck to what DAS developers have designed previously. You can be much more creative. Uh, they're very standard, so we follow all the standard protocols. They also include concurrency primitives like locks and queues and shared variables, which again follow the same Python primitives. Generally speaking, concurrent futures allow you to write uh, concurrent applications in a style very similar to how you would write on a single machine, uh, but have that scale nicely either on a single machine or on a cluster. So it allows for more custom situations. So it's a low level system. So for people who are looking for high level machine learning settings, this is not gonna be an exciting part of the talk, I apologize. If you're looking to build things, this might be more exciting. Uh, but we can use these, we'll use these later to build more high level systems. So is this legible in the back, uh, back row? Can I, get a, uh, can I get a thumbs up? Yes, it's great. Thumbs down, it's not great. Okay, seeing mostly great, great. Okay, so future. Uh, so I'm going to, if I wanted to uh, evaluate a function on some arguments, I might call func on args and quarks. However, I want to call this remotely. Oh, I have a bunch of machines somewhere. I'm gonna call this function somewhere else. I'm instead going to submit that function on those args and quarks, and we get back a future. I'm gonna get this back immediately, and that future is just going to be a reference to that computation happening somewhere else and to its eventual data in memory. If I wait a little while, look at that future again, I'll find that it's finished. So a future is tracking a single Python function being called somewhere else. If I then want to, I can then uh, get the result and that'll give me you know, a concrete result back locally. I may not want to do that. You know, that data might be big, I might not want to keep moving it across the network, that might be expensive. So I can call something remotely. It becomes very valuable when you add two features. The first one is dependencies. So if I call submit 
on f uh, you know, twice, I get two futures out, x and y. I can then call submit again with new functions on those futures, and that gives me a new future back. And Dask has, has tracked, oh, you're calling on a future. There's a dependency. This function requires the result of that other function. So I'm going to wait until that function is finished. Once all of its dependencies have been computed, I'm going to figure out where to place it and then call the function on that machine. So this API uh, allows you to build out task graphs with data dependencies by submitting futures on top of other futures. This is a, a sort of a small API issue, but allows you to, to build out more complex things. So that's feature one we need to make this interesting. Feature two is for loops. Uh, we can call sort of this sort of thousands of times per second, a few thousand. Uh, so you can submit uh, large task graphs uh, that depend on each other in fun ways. So let's go and look at an example. Oops, that's unfortunate. Oh, okay, those are great. So yeah, so I'm gonna go through what you should do. So uh, let me advertise Binder here. Uh, Binder is an excellent service uh, that's I think it was originally made in Genelia Farm and has sort of been moved over to a bunch of people at bids in UC Berkeley. And this is providing for me a single notebook server on Google Cloud that I can then run things on. Uh, it only stays around for around 20 minutes or so if you're inactive, so, which is why uh, my previous pages are broken. So let's go ahead and open up my futures notebook. Let's actually reset everything. Okay. So if you run this notebook, uh, this, you're producing a client here. This is running on one machine, uh, but you can get out the dashboard, which is handy. Okay, so I've got Dask running on this one machine. Uh, it has uh, four threads running and a little tiny bit of RAM. So I have a few functions here that are like my Fibonacci function, functions from before. They're just gonna sleep for a random amount of time to simulate work. They're gonna you know, add one to a number, multiply a number by two, add two numbers together. But please fill in your own functions. This might be read from a data source, parse that data, process that data, aggregate many pieces of data together. I can run those functions locally, and they'll take you know, some random amount of time between you know, zero and one seconds. Or I can run that function remotely Right, so here I'm calling increment on the number 10, and I get it back a future, and that future is pending. So if you look at this here, that future is pending. That was running some, somewhere else. If I look at the future again, it's probably finished. If I want, I can get the result back. 10 plus 1 is 11. So I've successfully run a function, a Python function, on some other remote place. Here a thread, but it could be a different machine. I can chain dependencies together by calling submit. Oops. Uh, in, uh, by one, one after the other. So here I'm calling ink on one, double on two, and then adding both of those results. And what that's gonna do, we can see here, it called, so what we're seeing here on the right is the Dask dashboard. Every horizontal line corresponds to the activity of a single thread on my cluster, or just local machine in this case. And we're seeing here, it called increment for looks like 190 milliseconds. At the same time, it was calling double for around 900 milliseconds. Once both of those finished, it called add on both of them. This was all on the same machine, but if this was on different machines, it would have probably moved the result of one to the other machine. So we're seeing here, uh, yeah, whoops. We are seeing here uh, how Dask is operating. If we want to get the results, but not very exciting. Okay, now let's come out with four loops, and now we're gonna see that we're gonna you know, do this thousands of times, and we're gonna use our cluster, right? So we're seeing the activity of what all these threads are doing over time, and they're, they're saturated. They're calling ink, they're calling double, they're calling add, one after another, they're really using the cluster. Uh, this is going a little bit slowly. I'm gonna add uh, some more workers. Uh, ideally, you'd be doing this with the cluster. Here, we're just adding more threads to our, our pool. Uh, but Dask is elastic, so you can dynamically add things and they run nicely. So, so uh, this is useful for simple things like embarrassingly parallel operations. It's also useful when you want to build up complex uh, systems. So I'm going to uh, add these features together, these remote numbers that are on my cluster. They're all sitting on the various threads of my cluster. And I'm gonna add them together uh, first pairwise. So I'm gonna you know, take two numbers, add those together, take those two numbers, add those together, and I'll have half as many numbers. I'll do that again and again and again and again, doing a tree reduction until I have only one result back. And so we're gonna run that here. 
And we're going to see, so the red is, is communication. It's communication between workers. There's little tiny bits of red as it moves integers back around. You can almost see the structure of, uh, of the, the tree sort of fall out here. At the beginning, there's lots of parallelism. At the base of the tree, and towards the top, there's not as much. Let's run that again, but now actually looking at the task graph. So this is the task graph we just ran. Let's run it again. And you can see the scheduler is sort of marching along here, uh, executing these functions in turn. Uh, the red ones are in memory. The green ones are processing. Let's do that again. So we're seeing the live dynamic action of our cluster. Okay. Now, I'm going to do something a little bit different. So this is not real time. right? Here, we had a graph. We gave DAS that graph. It executed that graph. It gave us back a result. That's much more sort of a, a batch thing, as people call it in Sparkland. Uh, but if we add a little sleep here, we can show that we don't need to do it that way. So in between every iteration of constructing this graph, I'm going to sleep for half a second. And so what you're supposed to see here is that as things are computing, the graph is itself growing. We don't have to submit everything at once. So this is now in sort of solidly real-time thing. We can grow the graph as it is computing. As maybe a more uh, complex example of that, so in our, in our original implementation, we took every pair of numbers as we had them organized in our local process, we added them together as we were organizing them in this list. But maybe you know, this number and this number finish first, they're going to stick around waiting for a while for their partner to also finish. And that maybe is bad for memory use. You know, here are their integers with their NumPy arrays, that would be bad. So let's add them together as they complete. This one finishes first, and this one finishes second. Let's add those together. So here we're going to use the as completed uh, function, which is going to form sort of a pool of futures, going to iterate them as they finish in the cluster. Then we're going to uh, pull off two futures from that iterator, create a new future that adds them together. Whoops and then add that new future back into the iterator uh, on which we're, we're looping. So this graph is a little bit messier. Uh, but if you were to look closely, uh, there, are, there are far fewer red boxes, uh, boxes that are in memory and not processing actively. So we're being a bit more efficient in our memory use by using some more real-time features. where my slides went. Let's just go to them again. OK, there are other features I haven't mentioned. Uh, you can submit tasks from other tasks. So here we have a function that we're submitting to run on some, some worker. And that function is itself getting a new client to talk back to the scheduler. And it's going to submit new jobs to the, to the, cl to the cluster. This allows for very dynamic workloads. You can have many different processes running that are all themselves asking the cluster to do different things. Things can get very messy, very complex, but this provides a lot of, a lot of freedom. Uh, for more uh, good example use case of this, look at the uh, SciPy talk in 2017 on Dask advanced use cases. This talks about a, a fun scientific application. Um, there are also concurrency primitives, things like locks and queues. When you have many of those workers that are all submitting things on their own, you often want to coordinate them. Uh, you want to make sure you're protecting shared resources, global resources like databases. You want to send things back and forth. Uh, and so we've implemented uh, standard Python APIs like locks and queues. They're, they look and feel exactly the same. But now they work well on a single machine or work well across a cluster. Uh, there are also a variety of options. You can specify resources like, hey, this particular task needs two gigabytes of RAM on a GPU. Or this particular task needs this specialized hardware. Uh, you can provide priorities. This is a very important task. Please run it before the others. Uh, you can say retries. You know, this task may fail. Allow it to retry at least five times. There are a variety of other options that people ask for. We've implemented over, we've implemented over time. So generally speaking, this is just a way to ask the task to do something. And there are a variety of scheduler, a variety of features in the scheduler that can tailor uh, exactly how you want to ask that. Okay. So 
Futures are a general purpose concurrency API that uses Dask as an execution platform. This allows you to build concurrent applications that scale nicely from single machines out to clusters uh, in a very ad hoc custom way. You can build your own bespoke systems. You can try it now. Uh, if you, if I'm, who has, who has, who has installed Anaconda? Okay, who here has, has installed Dask? It's the same hands. Right, Dask comes in Anaconda by default. You can also Conda install it. You can pip install it. It's a pure Python package. It's very lightweight. You can run it uh, trivially with these lines. So everything I've just done, you can also do it on your laptop. It's easy to do. Yeah, oh, laptops are opening. I'm, I'm happy, great. Uh, okay. So uh, at the beginning, I showed this dashboard with, with network data and producing a dashboard with, with cool, flashy, bokeh visuals. Uh, so let's talk about streaming data frames for a little bit. So this is sort of a very sexy topic. Uh, people don't actually do this with Dask much operationally, operationally today, uh, but you could. You could build this with futures, and we did a little bit. In an experimental package, you should not trust at all. Uh, so uh, you might want to uh, read from Kafka or file or sockets, do pandas-like operations, control flow over various things, uh, and manage side effects, uh, time and back pressure. You also want, apparently, scalable computing. Every streaming data frame system I've seen is attached to a scalable computing system, like Spark or Flink or Beam. Um, if you don't want the last one, uh, you can see a PyData New York City uh, 2017 talk talks about a project called Streams, uh, which is a small project from a few of us uh, that does the first four things, but not, not the last one. Uh, and that may actually be enough for you. The, the dashboard we saw in the beginning with network data, that was running on a single core. That was not scalable, and that was fine. Uh, but uh, we can also scale this library with Dask using features. So you've seen that. Uh, I'm going to blast through slides on streams. Streams gives you a basic stream primitive. Things are going to be flowing through it in an infinite way. You can you know, have a stream of data. You can map something onto it. You get a new stream of data with that function applied to it. You can accumulate state. You've got a stream of data. It's going to sort of keep some small amount of state around and emit new pieces of data downstream. You can branch. I've got this stream. I've got to want to do this thing to it and this other thing as well. Make sure data is piped appropriately. You can join. We've got two streams coming in at different rates. Maybe I want to join them with various kind of considerations. Uh, please accomplish that for me. There's a few different schemes in there for that. You want to handle time and back pressure. And back pressure. So you may have a variety of sources. You're sending a variety of syncs. Maybe your sync, maybe you're writing to some database, maybe that's slower than your Kafka queue you're reading from. So data might build up in various ways. And this would be bad. Uh, and so Streams provides a nice mechanism to uh, send signals throughout the system to make sure that everyone is checking in. There's various ways to shape that. Maybe you want to have external rate limits if you're talking to APIs. You know, there's certain areas it's safe to buffer data. So Streams is a, a general library to do the control flow part of building streaming systems. Um, yeah, handles all those things. Uh, it, it, is designed to run concurrently in a single thread. It's built on top of Tornado, and that's often enough. Uh, but we also threw in a Dask backend. It took around 20 lines of code, or sorry, 200 lines of code, uh, which makes it run nicely scalable on a cluster. So that doesn't do data frames. You need to add more for that. So the Streams data frame is a yet another um, explore, exploratory, not yet dependable uh, submodule of Streams, uh, which implements a common subset of Streams API. Aggregations, filtering, group operations, windowing operations. Uh, it's just a stream of pandas data frames. We just use pandas for execution. We don't need to re-implement all of that. Uh, use with caution. So uh, and that's actually not hard to do. Uh, this is you know run a thousand lines of code to write these things down. Uh, once you've sort of worked on DAS data frame for a long time, this is a relatively uh, easy task. You need to think about you know how to build marginal uh, marginal update algorithms, which are not you know, hard once you've done them for a while. You know, things like uh, mean might be a bit more complex than some. Group by mean is yet more complex. Windowed group by mean is yet more complex. But I think the organization we have in streams is, is reasonable. Uh, if you're interested in looking at that code, it's, it's fun to look at. There's a lot of marginal update algorithms uh, living on GitHub. So let's go ahead and look at an example. This is going to be fun. Let's restart that. Let's start up streaming data frames. OK, so I'm going to rely on Holoviews for streaming plotting. I'm going to set that up. 
Uh, to start off with, I'm actually not going to use Dask at all. Oops. I'm going to skip over this cell and just use it on a single, single core. I want to separate cleanly what is in Dask and what is outside of Dask. So I'm going to create a, a random data frame of time series data that is, uh, has entries every 10 milliseconds and is updated every 100 milliseconds. Uh, so this is using a very cool and also very experimental and glitchy uh, uh, integration with is, yeah. uh, integration with Jupyter. So we're seeing you know, not a single data frame up here, but a streaming data frame that's updating. I think we've followed it to only update every 500 milliseconds. And we can do simple things, you know, like what's the size of that thing? What does it mean? And rather than being you know, static outputs in Jupyter, uh, this is now a, a streaming output. This is using IPython widgets. Uh, these things might screw around a little bit. There are some bugs either in streams or Jupyter. We're not quite sure. Uh, but uh, so please uh, you know, be kind with any, any judgments. Yeah, there you go. Things are kind of glitchy. Here's a group by sum. Let's go ahead and let's plot that. Uh, this is a, a cool new project from the Holoviews folks called Holoplot. Uh, so here's a nice streaming plot of this data. Uh, this is going to keep increasing without bound because it's a streaming data set that's going to keep increasing without bound. So let's add a, a nice window operation on there. Okay. Uh, Holoviews and, and Holoplot can do a variety of different plots. Here's a classic cumulative sum plot for time series data. So there's things like that. So this is streams data frames with nice Jupyter notebook integration. And it looks flashy, right? This is like the flashiest, the flashiest demo, uh, despite having glitches. Uh, now the question is, given a system like this that was built without Dask in mind, can we parallelize it? Can we scale it? You know, if I have more data than fits in a single machine, how well does that work? The answer is yes, you can with Dask futures. I'm not going to show that code at all, but I'm going to run it, which will be fun. Uh, this took, I think, around 200 lines. So let's run that all again. But now we're going to start Dask. And so let's uh, grab our data set. No, that's not. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, whoever that was. Right, so I need at dask equals true. Who said live demos were hard? You got all these people to help you debug. Yeah. Great, so now we're seeing all those little, those little lines or little pandas data frames are being created you know, 10 times a second. As we do things like, say, ask you know, for more aggregations, uh, we're gonna start doing more and more work. So now we're, you know, we're scaling this very small computation across my, my four threads, but it'd be just as easy to scale across a cluster. So all the Dask machinery here works with this new system uh, just as cleanly. Yeah. These functions are not expensive to run. If we sort of pause here and... No. If we would pause here and look at those actual times, we find that they're in sort of the the few millisecond range. This is small data. We should not be using Dask for this, but we can. And Dask can respond to it in a nice way. If you look at the graph here, it's not going to be particularly informative. It's a bunch of very small computations. They're probably taking you know, more cost to render this image than to actually compute. So that's streaming data frames. If you're interested, look up streams. It's a fun project. Uh, it hypothetically does all the things that you want, or many of the things that you want. Linear operations, group operations, Kafka support, Jupyter notebook support, scaling. That being said, it's very young. There's probably lots of bugs. So please try it out. Please report issues uh, without much expectation. Okay. Uh, so in, in theory, this would be a very hard problem to solve. Streaming distributed, interactive, scalable data frames uh, are the hard idea. But we solved it with all of the various tools within the Python ecosystem. We use pandas for memory computing. We had to create streams. There's a few thousand lines of code to do the control flow. We use Dask for scalability. We use Jupyter for interaction. Uh, we use Holoviews and Bokeh for live plotting. And by building on all of those things, this actually became a pretty tractable problem. From a Dask perspective, I want to point out that Dask is one piece in here. And it can be one piece in other systems that you want to build. 
using things like Dask futures. So Dask plays a small part in other larger things. It is not a cohesive whole. It is a component that you can use if you understand APIs like futures to build your own things. Okay. Uh, example two is to be relatively brief and way less exciting. Uh, web servers. So we've installed the web server at the beginning. And it is slow. You should not build a web server in this way. Because we are calling computation directly in the code that handles uh, any requests from a user. Whenever a user hits this web page, they get pointed to this function, this function runs, and then writes that back to the result. So we don't want to do that. We want to do this in an asynchronous way using Dask. So Dask follows all the async await protocols that are common in Python 3 and that are well loved among people who do web programming. Dask fits very naturally into uh, concurrent stacks. So here we're going to, rather than call the function immediately, we're going to submit that task to happen somewhere else, on a cluster, on a different process of my local machine, somewhere. I can choose that later on, how that works. I'm going to wait until that feature finishes. I'm using async and await. If you haven't seen this, that's fine. You can do this with normal API as well, but it's, again, common in web programming. And so if we, instead of running our original sequential code, we run our Dask code. So we're now running this, this thing. Let's start up a schedule and we can see, ooh, that is, okay. Well, so we look at, say, you know, pip of 10. Every time I refresh this page, Dask is getting a new small task. Uh, let's see if we can uh, crank this up a little bit so that I can refresh fast enough. So those are fatter bars. They're spending more time, but it's still a little bit too fast. Let's see, 30, yeah, that'll be enough. So as I'm, sending, as I'm hammering my web server a lot, we're seeing the Dask is scaling up, and we're, we're using you know, the four processes on my machine to handle those a little better. And we can use all the nice standard features of Dask. We can look at you know, the graph. We can look at you know, a profile plot, and we can see how things are running over time. You know, the Fibonacci function called the Fibonacci function called the Fibonacci function called the Fibonacci function, et cetera. Um, we can see our use over time. There's lots of things that we can do. So we're getting all of the nice uh, accoutrement of using um, a nice distributed system like Dask in now a, not a distributed system at all, but a, a web server. So this is not a big data frame. It's something completely different that we can still leverage. So, okay. so uh, that's all I mostly have to say. Uh, some final thoughts. Uh, we should think about connecting Python analytics to operational systems. That seems to be a more increasing, it's an increasingly common conversation we seem to have. Uh, people are putting Python into production. They're putting Python, they're putting NumPy into the web server. They're using scikit-learn inside their company and a REST API. Uh, and how do we operationalize that? You know, Dask is one way. There's many other ways to do that. You know, I'm biased, obviously. Uh, but we should start thinking about that more as a community. Uh, Dask features are one way to do that and other things. Uh, they are flexible. You can do many different things with them. They're familiar. So if you are familiar with concurrent programming, Dask features should look very familiar to you. It's all the same Python APIs, Python protocols. We adhere to all the Python standards. It's a very natural part of the rest of the code base. It's also scalable. When I say that, I mean it scales down to a laptop. When I want to use my laptop or even just like a single thread, I often use Dask just for the profiler or the dashboard. And I have confidence that the code that I write can scale nicely out to a cluster when and if that ever becomes a priority for me. Uh, and you can build interesting systems. I hope I showed you a few interesting systems that are, are fun and neat. And hopefully you don't necessarily use those, but you use the, you use the same tools to enhance your own systems. So that's it. Thank you.